Can Iran convert its replica aircraft carrier into arsenal ship or missile barges or just tourist spot? Iran is repairing its imitation aircraft carrier, likely preparing it for a new round of exercises during which it will probably get blown up. The carrier, a mock-up built up from a floating barge, was first built in the early 2010s and then used for target practice. The barge is being rebuilt, presumably for more punishment, in an exercise with decidedly more sinister undertones than the first time around. The real purpose of refitting the barge was unknown. But it has still defenses purposes in case converted into arsenal ship or missile barges or just tourist spot. Let's talk arsenal ships and missile barges. Payloads, not platforms so saith a former CNO. So, how to get a whole lot of firepower into a single ship? About 20 years ago there were proposals for the minimally crude, missile-laden arsenal ship, designed to deliver a flexible package of ordnance downrange for support of, say, amphibious operations or something. The arsenal ship was developed initially as a demonstration program to provide a large increase in the amount of ordnance available to ground and sea-based forces in a conflict, particularly during the early days. The Navy envisioned that the ship would have a large capacity of different missiles, including Tomahawk and Standard, and space for future extended range gun systems. The ship could also have a sea-based version of the Army tactical missile system. This ship could greatly increase capabilities in littoral operations to conduct long-range strike missions, provide fire support for ground forces, defend against theater ballistic missiles, and maintain air superiority. The arsenal ship has the potential to provide substantial fire support to a variety of missions in regional conflicts without the logistics burden of transporting both delivery systems and ammunition to the shore and forward areas. The arsenal ship is expected to carry a large number of VLS cells but without the sophisticated command and control and radar equipment found on Aegis-equipped ships. The number of VLS cells being bandied about was 500 per ship, with 4 or 5 ships contemplated. More recently, the concept has been revived in the SSGN submarine conversions. The SSGN program office refueled and converted four SSBNs into SSGNs in a little more than five years at a significantly lower cost and less time than building a new platform. USS Ohio, SSGN 726, entered the shipyard on November 15, 2002, completed conversion in December 2005 and deployed for the first time in October 2007. USS Florida, SSGN 728, commenced its refueling and conversion in August 2003 and returned to the fleet in April 2006. USS Michigan, SSGN 727, started its shipyard availability in October 2004 and delivered in November 2006. USS Georgia, SSGN 729, completed conversion in December 2007. Combined, the four SSGNs represent more than half of the submarine force's vertical launch payload capacity with each SSGN capable of carrying up to 154 Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles. The missiles are loaded in seven-shot multiple all-up round canisters, max, in up to 22 missile tubes. These missile tubes can also accommodate additional stowage canisters for soft equipment, food, and other consumables to extend the submarine's ability to remain forward deployed in support of combatant commanders tasking. The missile tubes are also able to accommodate future payloads such as new types of missiles, unmanned aerial vehicles, and unmanned undersea vehicles. Well, heck, there has been discussion of using the LPD-17 hull to develop a ballistic missile defense ship with up to 288 VLS cells. Atop the superstructure is a massive S-band phased array radar, over 21 feet on each side. Compare that to the 12.5 feet diameter of the SPY-1 radars aboard Ticonderoga-class cruisers and R. Lee Burke-class destroyers. For radars, Larger size means greater range and better resolution and these arrays have three times the area of those which equip current BMD vessels. Starting behind the superstructure and continuing along the periphery to the stern is a vertical launch system, VLS, 
with 288 cells to carry surface-to-air missiles, SAMs, Tomahawk cruise missiles or vertical launch anti-submarine rockets, VLAs. For comparison, Tico's have 122, later Burks 96 and earlier Burks 90. So, that's triple the average missile load to start, with plenty of room to install more. Plus, the ship is taller than the surface combatants, which means it can hold future missiles of greater length and range. Why? Some suggest it would help defeat anti-access systems, as Captain Tang Reedy did in breaking the anti-access wall. Before describing the specifics of an arsenal ship, it is important to describe what it is not or rather, what it should not be. It is not a multipurpose ship, therefore, it is not a replacement for any other ship, especially not aircraft carriers. It is not a destroyer or cruiser capable of conducting missions in multiple domains, that is, anti-air, anti-surface, anti-submarine, and anti-ballistic missile warfare. Its weapons are for strike from the sea, not for war at sea. It is not a ship for all reasons. It is a gap filler that will give us the anti-anti-access capability that we need but do not have in the necessary quantity. A modern arsenal ship should not be designed to make port visits, provide humanitarian assistance, provide C2, host any sort of staff, or do anything else other than fulfill the third capability required to defeat anti-access strategies, provide maximum volume of precise fire onto enemy targets. The C2 of its ordnance should come from other warships. Its long-range and mid-range defenses would be provided by the rest of the fleet or other joint assets. It should not be expected to operate independently, although a low maximum speed and unique seakeeping characteristics might require independent transits and tactical rendezvous with deception techniques minimizing the risks. Perhaps we should call it a self-propelled arsenal barge. Snafu has this image of a towed missile barge, the source of which is hard to track, but the caption on the picture indicates this is Russian design using a Sovereignty class destroyer as a towing ship. In the meantime, there is this 2005 article by Commander John B. Perkins from the Armed Forces Journal, Surface Ship, Submarine Missions Are Coalescing to Ponder. Andrew F. Krepinevic, Director of the U.S. Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, CSBA, alluded to this trend 10 years ago. Just as bombers are becoming relatively less important than the ordnance they carry, he said, so too might surface warships, which could evolve to become barges, with some perhaps operating below the surface, for advanced conventional munitions that can strike pre-designated targets at extended ranges. This concept makes the case that barges would be ideal as strike platforms of the future. The reference to the barges operating below the surface is the first precursor toward the idea of larger systems operating underwater. One of Krepinevica's associates at CSBA put it this way, this type of basic anti-navy architecture could be made more effective by incorporating increasingly sophisticated mines, active and passive sea-based sensor networks and quiet attack submarines. Such architectures would have far lower barriers to entry, cost and learning, than carrier battle group operations, potentially enabling those competitors to leapfrog the carrier era and become major maritime competitors, at least in literal waters. Absent a revolutionary breakthrough in ASW anti-submarine warfare, naval power projection operations could be driven subsurface. This reference brings the point home in stark fashion, technologies meant to find and destroy objects will become inexpensive and plentiful. The world's strongest navy should not build anything but ships that employ the best covering tactics available. The CSBA suggested that the capital ship of the fleet in 2020 might be an arsenal ship a missile firing submersible armed with cruise and conventional ballistic missiles and that such ships might be armed with a few hundred to a thousand missiles. A distributed power projection navy might include several classes of arsenal ships and other submersible power projection forces in the fleet. Of course, here's the 12-year-old kicker. The Navy must become bold in decision-making before it is relegated to playing catch-up in a world fast becoming shaped by quick striking revolutions in military affairs. Well, we've got the SSGNs. China is developing a warship of naval theorists' dreams, 
an arsenal ship that can be submerged in water. The Chinese Navy is taking arsenal ships in a new direction as giant submersibles. Post-Cold War naval theorists have long dreamed of recreating the old battleship's power through massive arsenal ships, or warships carrying hundreds of guided missiles that could fire at land and sea targets. Now it looks like China wants to make that dream a reality. Professor Dong Wen CAI, the late Chinese hydrodynamics expert, shows a sketch of a submersible major combatant, with a flat hull and mid hull steering fins. CNTV. Stories circulating on Chinese websites, including the Wuhan city government site, mention that Chinese institutions are conducting studies on gigantic submersible arsenal ships. What's the big deal about an underwater arsenal vessel? Well, submerging all or even most of a large warship would reduce its radar and visual signature, as well as protect it against most missile threats. This computer generated line drawing of the Chinese wave skimmer shows hull mounted fins that allow for maneuverability and underwater, and semi submerged, operation. It appears to also be capable of hydroplaning. NSFC. There are two concepts in circulation. One is a high-speed warship with much of its hull submerged but otherwise has a functional superstructure with defense weapons and radar, the other is almost completely submerged arsenal ship with two conning towers. The scale of the designs are significant, either ship would displace roughly about 20,000 tons at full load. The submersible warship has four stages, submerged, partial exposure of the superstructure, raising the hull to the water line and as a low draft, and operating as a high-speed hydroplane. NSFC. Reports claim there has been substantial design work and concept proofing for this underwater arsenal ship. Even on his deathbed, leading naval engineer Professor Dongwei CAI continued to work on a key aspect of the arsenal ship design, the high-speed wave hydroplane. For stealth operations, the arsenal ship would have most of its hull inherently submerged, with only the bridge and a few other parts of the ship above the water line, reducing the radar cross-section. But when traveling with a high-speed naval task force, the arsenal ship will sacrifice stealth to use its flat hull bottom to hydroplane at high speeds, cutting across the waves like a speedboat or amphibious armored vehicle. The second design is more conventional, it is essentially a giant, conventionally propelled submarine with two conning towers stuffed with snorkels, periscopes, and communications antennae. Given its need to keep up with high-speed surface ships and its lack of high-speed endurance underwater, this arsenal ship design would operate similarly to World War II submarines, the majority of its voyage will take place on the surface, and will submerge only during combat and under attack. Chinese research institutes have been testing sub-models of both arsenal ship configurations since 2011, including open water tests for the hydroplane arsenal ship and laboratory tests for the arsenal submarine. Unverified rumors on the Chinese internet claim that a full-scale, proof-of-concept is under construction at Bohai Shipbuilding Heavy Industrial Corporation, to be launched after 2020. Should the U.S. Navy turn merchant ships into floating missile magazines? The U.S. Navy could buy older civilian merchant ships on the cheap and convert them into floating arsenals. The concept, outlined in the U.S. Naval Institute, envisions adding dozens if not hundreds of multi-use missile silos to the ships to provide additional firepower to the Navy while it struggles to reach its 355 ship goal. The idea is an attractive one but has a number of issues under the surface. The heart of today's U.S. Navy's surface ship firepower, which lives on destroyers and cruisers, is the armored missile silo. The Arleigh Burke, class guided missile destroyers each carry 90 to 96 Mk-41 vertical launch silos, the Ticonderoga class guided missile cruisers carry 122 Mk-41 silos, and the Zumwalt class carries 80 Mk-57 silos. Each of these silos can carry one long-range anti-ballistic missile interceptor, surface-to-air missile, land-attack cruise missile, anti-submarine rocket torpedo, or anti-ship missile each, or even up to four smaller short-range air defense missiles. This versatility makes the fleet endlessly adaptable. A destroyer can carry all surface-to-air missiles, all anti-ship missiles, or a mix of all types. There are a few catches. 
These silos are enormously expensive to add to the fleet, Arleigh Burke, class destroyers cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 billion each, meaning each silo costs about $15 million each to put to sea, missile not included. Also, once a silo is loaded in port the missiles can't be swapped out at sea. A destroyer that inadvertently brings a belly full of anti-ship missiles to a submarine hunt must go back to a friendly port and swap missiles. An article from the U.S. Naval Institute discusses one possible relief to the silo problem. One of the main barriers is hull cost. Why not buy second-hand commercial tanker hulls for $25 to $50 million each, as opposed to $1.5 billion for a brand new destroyer, and then strap missile silos to the deck. These silos could then be data linked to the rest of the fleet, providing firepower on demand for the real warships. The article makes the case that 30 to 50 missile silos per ship is a good number, and that converting 10 to 15 cargo ships would give the fleet between 300 and 750 missile cells at a fraction of the cost and time for new build surface combatants. Civilian ships have long served in the Navy, often as auxiliary, second-line ships meant to free up warships for more vital missions. Now, technology could allow civilian ships to be fitted with the latest technology to engage adversaries from up to hundreds of miles away. The Navy already has ships in the fleet that are former merchantmen. The hospital ships Mercy and Comfort are ex-oil tankers fitted to provide medical services for up to 500 personnel. Hospital ships are not warships, however, and the commercial ship turned warship concept could have complications. Warships are built to a very high standard, designed to take physical punishment and continue fighting. Civilian ships aren't meant to fight and are built to a less rigorous standard. In 2016, the aluminum hulled high speed trimaran Swift was heavily damaged while supporting UAE forces involved in the war in Yemen. As a civilian ship pressed into military duties, Swift likely did not have the built in resilience of purpose built warships and a dedicated damage control party to limit the spread of damage. Commercial ships are also slower than warships, which would drag down the fleet's effective top speed, limiting its ability to respond to situations. Older commercial ships could have less reliable propulsion and other systems. Finally, their resemblance to ships in civilian service could make those civilian ships targets, as an adversary tries to hunt down and eliminate these heavily armed ships. Still, if the Navy can accept or mitigate these issues without the need for expensive, bureaucratic, time-consuming fixes, it can vastly increase its floating firepower. For the price of one new destroyer with 96 missile silos it could easily have up to 30x commercial vessels with 50 missiles each. One destroyer can only be in one place at a time, but 30x commercial vessels could be in 30 different places all over the globe. Is that an acceptable trade-off?